Welcome everyone. We'll give it just one more minute uh, to make sure everybody can log on who'd like to log on. Okay, I think we can get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Erica Dale, and I'm here on behalf of the American Physiological Society's Respiration Section. Thank you all so much for joining us today for the Joint APS Respiration Section CIREC event, Basic Barometric Plethysmography Techniques and Respiratory Science, a crucial tool in the study of opioid abuse and breathing pathologies. APS would like to thank our partners at CIREC and especially APS members, Drs. Melissa Bates and Ryan Davis for assisting with the organization of today's event. I do have a couple of housekeeping notes. We ask that you refrain from taking photo or video captures of any of the scientific presentations in whole or in part. And we're gonna field our questions after both speakers have presented. So along the way, just uh, put your questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our two speakers today. Dr. Laura DeRusso is a professor at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York, where she studies the neural control of cardiorespiratory function with a focus on physiological changes across the lifespan in developmental disabilities. Dr. Erica Levitt is an assistant professor at the University of Florida, where she studies the neural control of breathing, especially in the context of respiratory neurons in the pons that are important to opioid-induced respiratory depression. It's now my absolute pleasure to turn the session over to our first presenter, Dr. Laura DeRusso. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank CIREC for the opportunity to present today, and of course also the APS respiration section and uh, APS uh, generally, which has been so supportive to my career and uh, to so many of my students. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, how we've used plethysmography to monitor breathing in mice in different models, both in control strains and differently different genetically modified strains. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just a very brief history, and a lot of this was covered in, in great depth um, on the previous webinar uh, about barometric plethysmography. But uh, just very briefly, it was originally published for use in hamsters in 1954. And then of course, the, the uh, publication of Durban Fenn in 1955, which is the, the uh, algorithm that many of us use uh, to calculate tidal volume for um, use with plethysmography. And then uh, publications in rats came about 10 years later and then mice. And so why would we want to use plethysmography? You know, why, is, why have people been interested in this technique? So really it's a tool to monitor uh, breathing changes across the lifespan. So to me, the, the reason it's such a powerful tool is that you can do repeat testing uh, that's non-invasive. And also students can learn it in one semester. So I work primarily with undergraduate students and this is an ideal candidate method for them to learn and become autonomous with. Um, it also yields a tremendous amount of data. So once you have performed uh, an initial data collection, there's a lot of analysis that can be done uh, after the fact. And it's been widely used in rats since the 1970s to, to, to now, uh, but there was a lot more interest for uh, use in mice, of course, as uh, genetically uh, altered mice have been more common and mice are such a common strain now to, that are used in biomedical research. Uh, I do just wanna point out because so much of the initial work was done in rats, a lot of that can be, a lot of that 
part of the method can be translated to mice, but not all of it, because mice do have different physiology. Uh, they have different stressors. And so it's something to keep in mind. Um, and then another reason that plethysmography is so popular is that now there are commercially available systems. And so this is really great, uh, but it also means that we can all buy a turnkey system, uh, but we might need some help with how to interpret it or just a, more of a consensus about the best way to collect and uh, present these types of, of uh, data. So there are different chambers available. There's the head out method, which of course the mouse has its head out. Um, and then there's also the unrestrained or the also called the whole body plethysmograph. So hopefully you can uh, appreciate the differences here. So the head out is commonly used for uh, smaller animals where you might have smaller tidal volumes. Um, and I think Dr. Levitt will, might be talking uh, more about that particular method. And then the, the whole body uh, plethysmograph, an animal can move around and it might be more indicative of a, a calm animal like present in their cage. And I just want to emphasize that these two techniques, while some of their uh, basic methodologies are similar, it's important to understand the details so that we don't directly compare uh, data from one method uh, to another. And so with the head out method, uh, it results in higher breathing frequencies uh, compared to the whole body plethysmograph. And this could be due to the, to the restraint stress or could be due to pressure on the, the neck. Uh, so it's just important to recognize uh, the differences. So this paper just came out last week using a leak-free method for um, head out. And they have this uh, table in their publication that already has a uh, really nice uh, reported value ranges for breaths per minute with the head out method, and that's 250 to 350 breaths per minute. And then their values were 270 breaths per minute. And I just want to point out the difference there because quiet breathing with a whole body plethysmograph is around 150 breaths per minute. So again, just to recognize the different types of data or how that physiology is going to be different and the parameters will be different with these two different techniques. Um, it's not that one is better than the other, it's just that they are different and not directly comparable. And so with regards to the 150 breaths per minute as an average value across different strains, uh, we've shown that in CD1 mice, breaths per minute are, are around 140 breaths per minute, shown here on the left panel. And in two different studies, we did one um, where we tested CD1 mice and then gave them seven days of saline injections, and then another where we were um, comparing the Heinlein casting model, which results in muscle wasting. And we observed that when they were casted and then after casting, their breathing frequency uh, was similar. So that was around 140 breaths per minute. But uh, don't just take my word for it. There's, of course, a very exhaustive study by Tankersley uh, comparing multiple different strains of mice. And what they observed, uh, although frequency was presented in Hertz, I've converted it here to breaths per minute, so around 106 to 163 breaths per minute. Um, it is important to note that with their, their particular experiment, uh, mice were housed at a warmer ambient temperature and the relative humidity was 90%. So some things to think about when we're comparing data across different studies. Um, but this is these are values with the whole body plethysmograph. And just something else to consider with uh, the head out method is that there's some new data. This particular study is showing that with immobilizing restraints such as scruffing, which is shown here in green, that following, uh, briefly following immobilizing uh, restraint, that there's a drop in heart rate across uh, different sexes and strains of mice, and that it is vaguely mediated. So they administered at atropine to the mice and observed that that uh, depression in heart rate was blunted. Uh, with atropine, uh, showing that it is vaguely mediated. Uh, so these data are just important to consider when we're using these different types of methods and, and for how to interpret the data. And so some best practices, just um, considering the different types of chambers and uh, some talking points, hopefully we can continue. This is a, a lively discussion. Uh, at the end of our two talks, uh, th this is my interpretation, but I'd of course like to have uh, more conversation about this. I just think it's really important to describe the type of chamber when we're citing different values um, and then use relative differences in uh, when describing uh, data in a discussion. Uh, of course, most people are going to give their 
the exact type of uh, method used in their in their particular methods. But when we're comparing data across the literature, I think it's just important to mention what type of chamber has been used. And then the behavior of the mouse is important to understand uh, a lot of things, right? Is the mouse stressed? Um, are we at a truly quiet breathing state uh, for the mouse? And this quiet breathing state is, some, is something that I've been really interested in for the last decade uh, and tried to establish uh, the best way to determine a quiet breathing state in mice. Uh, but I just wanna emphasize that I'm certainly not the first person to, to come up with this idea of the importance of quiet breathing. So in 1954, uh, when Chapin first published this, this method in hamsters, uh, he mentioned then how important uh, calm breathing is due to the pressure changes that can occur with, with other types of locomotion. And, and so I'll talk a little bit about how we observe quiet breathing and then how we also interpret the other um, strings of data that, that are more active. And so what, what is calm breathing? What's it look like? So the top panel is a calm breathing trace and hopefully you can observe that it's, it's relatively similar across the entire trace. This is in you know, a control animal. Uh, that it is possible with genetic you know, genetically different mice that, that might be slower or faster, or even have some apneas in there. But calm, calm, quiet breathing does have a relatively, uh, it's, it's relatively obvious to observe um, on the breathing trace. And you pair that with a mouse that is awake, but sitting relatively still in its cage. Um, versus active breathing on the bottom panel is hopefully uh, what it sounds like. It's more active, right? The mouse might be sniffing, grooming, moving about uh, the chamber. And the active breathing sections are also valuable for interpretation. So we can use those, uh, those parts of the data for variability, apneas, uh, apnea count, augmented breath count. Um, and then uh, Sunshine and Fuller have recently published how it can be used for cluster analysis as well. Um, that was in rats and hopefully it can also be translated to, to mouse. And so I just want to talk briefly about how we use these shorter versus longer durations of data. So with the longer periods of data, like 30 to 60 minutes, uh, my group will go in and count uh, apneas and augmented breath. So augmented breath shown here, and then uh, apneas with this long string of uh, lack of flow. And so we'll count that over 30 minutes or 60 minutes. And uh, the apneas, just I personally think are, are more appropriate to count over a longer time period because you're more likely to, to count maybe 10 or 20 apneas um, as opposed to in a much shorter string. Uh, again, you would get a shorter, uh, obviously a, a lower number, but possibly more likely um, to, to have error there. Uh, what we've also done though, when we count apneas, we also follow up with pulse oximetry. And this, these are data here, of a mouse that was exposed to isoflurane and then was allowed to wake up and ambulate for the next two hours. And what we observe are that uh, there are desaturations that occur in C57 BL6J mice um, that are active in their cage. So we do observe desaturations along with apneas, even in healthy uh, control animals. And I've been trying to show this particular image a lot to get people excited about it. And I, I think uh, Dr. Bates is, she was interested in this, this data and we're trying to follow up um, to find out more about how these desaturations, how they correlate with uh, respiratory flow so we can do these experiments at the same time. So the calm breathing that we initially were trying to uh, analyze when I first started my lab, I was trying to do 10 minutes of calm breathing. And it was actually relatively, it, feasible. Uh, we were using control animals, young control animals. It was relatively feasible to get calm 10 minutes of continuous calm breathing in, in an hour or two, two hours. And then we would average those data, have about a thousand breaths to analyze and go from there. What we observed though, was that this 10 minutes of calm breathing was harder and well, more and more challenging to achieve when we were comparing light and dark cycles, when we compared older animals, and then when we were looking at a strain that had higher levels of anxiety, we found that it would, it would sniff and move around the cage more often. And so this 10 continuous minutes was more challenging to achieve. And so we went ahead and did the experiment to, to confirm if a shorter duration was going to give us similar quality data. And what we observed was that a 15 second uh, bout of calm breathing is actually very similar to this 10 minute um, 
10 minute analysis that we had been trying to do. Um, and so, and then we followed that up with uh, multiple other bouts of 15 seconds throughout the tracing and found that they were all similar. And so we have gone to actually for calm breathing only using a 15 second uh, string of data with, with very calm continuous breathing. And then we use the other 30 to 60 minutes of active breathing to count apneas and, and augmented breaths. And so I've talked a lot about frequency and um, you know, factors that influence frequency, uh, but sometimes the more controversial aspects of plethysmography include the tidal volume calculation. And so factors that influence that are barometric pressure, humidity, both the input humidity and the chamber humidity, and then of course, chamber and body temperature. And so barometric pressure, we don't need to spend too much time on. It typically, it really should not fluctuate in any given lab environment. Um, and then even uh, Mortola and Frappel had, had published that even a 50 millimeter mercury error is only going to result in a 4% difference in tidal volume. So it, in my experience, this would be a very minimal error. Um, you can, of course, test your own software, go ahead and change these values, see how much of a difference um, you're able to get with your particular uh, software system. But I have not observed barometric pressure to be a major issue uh, with error. Uh, the most likely error, I would think, would be if a channel were plugged, some sort of human error where a channel were plugged in incorrectly, and you would notice that right away. So humidity to me is something that is somewhat underappreciated with plethysmography data collection. And so it's important to know both the input and the chamber humidity. So if you're using gas tanks, um, they should be dry and they are typically only going to be about 10 to 20% relative humidity. They are very unlikely to fluctuate across the experiment, but it is important that you know what the input humidity is. And so you can do that by running 10 minutes of an empty chamber to identify uh, your relative humidity input. If you're using room air, you could have more um, fluctuations for hum humidity input, but a really easy way to avoid that is to use both a desiccant and or a nifeon tubing, which will help to stabilize uh, the humidity. Chamber humidity is, is going to have a lot more fluctuations and it's highly influenced by animal behavior. So if you have an animal that's moving around a lot, is very active, is defecating or urinating, you're going to have much higher humidity. And also if you have a lower inflow, you're going to be more li likely to build up humidity. You can always flush the chamber by briefly running a very high uh, inflow uh, to, to reduce that humidity. But humidity is something that changes throughout the experiment. And I think it's, it's important to keep it within a range. We keep our humidity between 50 and 75% uh, through our experiments. Um, some experiments that are very long might keep it at 90%. So this image is, is likely uh, familiar to many of us using plethysmography. So this is an image from Martola and Frappel showing the on the left panel is an animal um, housed in an environment that's 37 degrees Celsius, 100% relative humidity. So it's identical to the mouse that's being tested. And the point is that even though tidal volume, even though the animal is breathing, the pressure signal is going to be much smaller. And that's because there's less of a differential here. And then in order to, cheat, uh, to achieve that difference in pressure, you want to have a differential here. So here it's 25 degrees Celsius and 50% relative humidity. And I'm just pointing out that we do want some sort of differential when we're um, calculating uh, tidal volume across animals. And I would just argue that it's important to try to standardize this across your experiments if it's at all possible. Now, of course, animal body temperature cannot be standardized and that's something that we would enter in uh, to our software if it's changing. And so if you do need to reduce chamber humidity, if for some reason it's gone up uh, to 99% or the animal's urinating a lot, uh, you could just raise the flow very briefly. Um, sometimes it only takes 30 seconds, and then you'll just wait two to four minutes for your chamber to re-equilibrate. And now moving on to body temperature and chamber temperature, uh, this image is probably familiar to, to a lot of people as well. Uh, it's essentially showing how changes or errors in body temperature and chamber temperature can influence the tidal volume calculation. And essentially, if, 
is in this uh, on the x axis is the difference between the measured and the correct temperature, and then the y axis is the tidal volume percent of the correct value. Uh, I do want to point out this these particular data were all uh, assumed at 100% relative humidity. So again, just something else to, to keep in mind when we're considering all of these different errors. Uh, but essentially what this image is showing is that a one degree error, uh, either in body temperature or chamber temperature, can result in about a 7 to 11% tidal volume difference. So again, we want to be careful with um, accurately measuring both body temperature and chamber temperature, and these are usually um, the chamber temperature is easily collected with a commercial system, and then the body temperature can be collected by the investigator and entered um, into the software at the end of the experiment if there were any changes. And so again, commercial systems are going to measure chamber temperature, uh, also relative humidity within the chamber. Um, I would say that best practice is really to measure body temperature at set time points, you know, during room air, every 10 minutes is probably enough, but during hypoxia or hypercapnia, you might want to do that every one or two minutes. Um, and it is most likely to drop during hypoxia, and so the chamber, um, it's just important to, to follow that. Um, chamber temperature will definitely influence the potential to drop, have any type of drop in body temperature. So. We house our mice at 24 to 25 degrees Celsius, which is slightly warmer than some standard lab environments. And we don't observe in the mice that we're testing, we haven't observed any uh, drops in, during hypoxia of greater than one degree, um, but other types of genetically altered mice um, are definitely more likely to, to have these changes in body temperature. So we do still wanna make sure that we're collecting these data and have them um, in case there are changes. And just be aware that if you're housing mice at a lower temperature, they're going to be more likely to drop body temperature, especially during hypoxia. Okay, so just to sum up, factors that influence tidal volume. Uh, barometric pressure, of course, that goes into the calculation. We need to monitor it, but it's unlikely to be uh, an, a source of error. Uh, humidity, it's just important that we know the humidity. So we need to measure the input humidity at the start of the experiment. And then um, I recommend choosing a range to maintain the chamber. It does you know, go into the calculation and as long as we're accounting for it, it should be enough. Um, however, I, I don't agree that uh, testing a mouse at 99% humidity, you are going to get a different, the same mouse, you're going to get a different tidal volume if you're now testing them at 10% humidity. And so if there's any way to standardize this across an experiment, um, I highly recommend it. Um, and then chamber temperature is typically limited to air um, because it is monitored by the system unless you have some sort of uh, temperature gradient in your chamber, uh, it is unlikely to have uh, this error uh, with the tidal volume calculation. And then body temperature, we just want to make sure that we're monitoring temperature and that we enter values if they do change during the experiment. And so now on the metabolic data, which in my opinion is a little more complex, at least when uh, working with students and, and teaching them this portion of the method, uh, mainly because the oxygen and CO2 analyzers are flow dependent. And so how we calibrate these analyzers is really important for um, making sure that we have accurate values. So if you calibrate at one liter per minute and then you run your entire experiment at 200 mils per minute, you're going to get different values. And so you do need to account for that. Um, and then for us to gain sensitivity with, with mouse, this is something where I find is really different between rat and mouse uh, flows for plethysmography. We've had to lower the inflow into the chamber to about 100 to 200 mils per minute. Uh, we choose a very specific uh, flow for an entire experiment, um, but it does need to be adjusted for, for animal size. So we had found what I thought was a sweet spot of 140 mils per minute. Uh, for all metabolic measurements. And then we started testing mice that were you know, much, much smaller and we had to account for the entire experiment and had to lower the flow. So this does need to be specific to your particular mouse model. During metabolic data collection, I aim for a CO2 of about 0.1 to 0.5. Um, that's to give us enough sensitivity to actually measure VCO2. And I find that those values also um, are a good metric for, for getting uh, accurate values for VO2 as well, uh, that flow that gives us the right flow. Um, and then flow can only be lowered for a set amount of time. So we lower it for 10 minutes. Um, and the reason it can't be the entire experiment is that typically humidity, humidity will 
uh, be altered if you're going to lower the flow. And so for most of our experiment, we run it at 300 mils per minute, but then when we're collecting metabolic data uh, for baseline, we lower it to uh, about 150 mils per minute. And so the overall uh, protocol that, that I use is that we calibrate the chamber, right, pressure and flow, um, oxygen and CO2 analyzers, and then we collect data with an empty chamber. So we use these values with the empty chamber to then enter FiO2, FiCO2, and relative humidity input. Um, then you go ahead and weigh the mouse, put them in the chamber, allow them to habituate 30 to 60 minutes. It's usually set for a particular experiment, um, and that flow will be at 300 mils per minute. And then we'll use th this entire amount of data for counting apneas, augmented breaths, and variability. And then when we go on to do the metabolic and calm baseline uh, for the VO2 and VCO2 data, what we'll do is we'll lower the flow from 300 to about 150. Again, it's, it's dependent on your uh, model uh, for 10 minutes. And so we'll identify 15 second bouts of quiet breathing within this 10 minutes. And then we can also calculate active segments uh, for VE, VO2, and VE, VCO2. And so just briefly, I'm hoping to show you some of the data, um, some of how we can apply this protocol to a mouse model of Down syndrome, which is TS65DN, and then I'll compare that to some wild type mice. So Down syndrome, has, uh, people with Down syndrome have increased apnea, uh, aspiration, pneumonia, respiratory infections, uh, lower FEV1. So they have, they have ventilation deficits. And TS65DN has been used uh, as a mouse strain to investigate primarily cognitive issues related to Down syndrome. And they, it hasn't actually been formally ev evaluated as a model to study respiratory function. And so that's what I'm gonna show you here very briefly. So uh, the pattern of breathing is similar at baseline and TS65 DN, which are shown here at three, six and 12 months of age. But uh, VEVCO2 is actually higher in uh, TS65 DN, the model of Down syndrome, and that's due to the lower uh, metabolic rate uh, in these animals. So they have some sort of mismatch uh, between VE and uh, VCO2. And then there is also a blunted CO2 response uh, in TS65DN. So on the left is a 12 month old group, uh, their response to hypoxia, which is similar to wild type. And then on the right, there's a blunted response to hypercapnia. So this is age dependent. We don't observe this blunting of the hypercapnic response until 12 months of age. But this demonstrates there's some sort of either a CO2 sensing or, or motor output response in these mice. And then we also observe lower inspiratory, mean inspiratory flow in TS65DN, which can be a metric for the neural drive to breathe. And so although baseline breathing was not, baseline pattern of breathing was not different in these animals, we do have other indications that their overall neural control is different. Uh, we also went on to do apnea counts. And again, this is over a, a longer time period, over 60 minutes. And we observed that apneas are higher in TS65DN compared to wild type. Uh, however, the augmented breasts are not different across a uh, group, although there is an age effect where augmented breasts are reduced um, as the mice age. Uh, we also went on to monitor desaturations uh, with a pulse oximeter in TS65DN. So these are in mice walking around in their home cage. And uh, we do observe both a strain and an age effect where there are increased numbers of desaturation in TS65DN. So some, like some part of their physiology is causing uh, more hypoxemias or desaturations. Uh, and we also observe that uh, O2 carrying capacity is lower. So both hemoglobin and hematocrit are also lower in these mice. Um, however, uh, arterial blood sampling show that PO2 and PCO2 are similar compared to wild type. And so just to recap, and I'm hoping that we can have a, a lively discussion uh, after Dr. Lovett's talk as well. So plethysmography can be used to compare respiratory patterns uh, and VEVO2, so and VEVCO2. Um, and TS65DN has increased apneas, reduced uh, VTTI, which is an indication of a reduced neural drive, along with the attenuated response to hypercapnia. So uh, taken together, these indicate that there is a different uh, neural either sensory or output uh, in these animals. 
And uh, the elevated desaturations are also present in addition to the lower oxygen carrying capacity of lower hemoglobin and uh, lower hematocrit. And I'd like to thank everyone, um, definitely my collaborators, uh, Dr. Bates and Dr. Burns, who worked on some of the, the earlier work with TS65DN and uh, our statistician and a former postdoc who is now at Ithaca College. And of course, all the students that are involved in the work. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, while we're switching out slides and getting Dr. Levitt's talk up, I just wanna encourage and applaud the number of questions and the comments that are, that are happening right now. Keep that going. Uh, we knew this was a lively audience. So we will address things at the end. Um, all right, I need you to stop sharing your screen so that I can share. Thank you. Okay. All right, you should be seeing my slides now and be able to hear me. Um, so I would like to thank Laura for a really great um, seminar. I knew it would be good and I was lived up to every expectation uh, that I had, at least. Um, I'd also like to thank APS and CYREC for sponsoring this event and for allowing me to participate. So I'm gonna follow up by just talking about some of our data where we use plethysmography in combination with neurophysiology in order to sort of dissect the mechanisms of opioid-induced respiratory depression. So as we are all likely aware, um, we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic. Shown here are some data from the CDC. Um, and if anything, um, this epidemic is accelerating and not decreasing, now being largely driven by illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And the cause of death from opioid overdose is respiratory depression. We know from studies in receptor knockout animals that the new opioid receptor specifically is what's responsible for respiratory depression. I'm gonna show a little bit of data on this in a couple of slides. Um, this opioid induced respiratory depression can be rapidly reversed by administration of naloxone or Narcan. And while this is life-saving, it will reverse all opioid effects simultaneously leading to the potential for uh, withdrawal and uncontrolled pain. In addition, um, prior to overdose, opioids cause a variety of effects on breathing, um, which can be measured, mostly uh, measured using plethysmography. So the most well-known effect is of opioids is that they decrease respiratory rates. There are also dose-dependent changes in tidal volume. Opioids also decrease the pattern and the regularity of breathing, and opioids decrease our reflex response to hypercapnia and hypoxia further sort of worsening the effect of opioids from these inhibiting this protective reflex. Uh, opioids also cause um, effects on the upper airways, leading to aspiration difficulty, swallowing, and obstructive breathing. And opioids cause sedation and sleep disruptions, as well as skeletal muscle rigidity, which can impact the ability to ventilate. And then Finally, at least in rodents, opioids cause this increase in locomotor activity. So I wanted to show a video of what that looks like in a mouse. Um, so here are four mice in the Cyreg VivoFlow plethysmography chambers. Two of them have been given morphine at 30 milligrams per kilogram. You can see the two with morphine are kind of doing constantly um, doing this circling behavior. This mouse is pausing to switch directions um, but it, they really don't stop moving. So it's really difficult to um, have quiet breathing periods uh, in animals that are treated with opioids. Um, if you also notice this mouse um, in chamber two, especially is, has his tail um, elevated and that's called straw tail. And it's another indicator, nice indicator that opioids have uh, been administered to an animal. So we can still, even though these animals are locomoting, we can still separate the breathing signal from um, locomotor artifacts. Um, and so what we use is the active, what Laura described as active breathing. Um, so shown here are two example traces uh, from a mouse treated with saline and another mouse treated with morphine. And if you look at the frequency, 
you can see that uh, morphine uh, significantly decreases the frequency of breathing with a non, uh, non significant change in tidal volume and a small decrease in minute ventilation. We then ventilate these chambers with air that contains higher levels of CO2. So we used for this experiment 7% CO2 that increases both the frequency and the tidal volume of the um, mouse's breathing and a large increase in minute ventilation. And then when you administer morphine on top of the hypercapnia, you now get a significant decrease again in frequency, also in tidal volume and this large decrease in minute ventilation. And this is pretty prototypical response um, with opioid agonists. Um, it's not specific just to morphine. Um, so here is a study that was performed by Graham Henderson's lab, and he's measuring breathing using whole body plethysmography um, with elevated CO2. So this is done by some groups. Um, it's a little bit easier to see the inhibition by opioids when the increased drive. Um, so he used three different types of opioid agonists, morphine, heroin, and fentanyl. The doses are shown here. And they saw that there was, a, with all three of these agonists, a significant decrease in breathing rate um, and minute ventilation, but a small or non-significant change in tidal volume. So pretty consistent. Uh, and then we know that opioid effects on breathing are due to mute opioid receptors. Um, and shown here is a study from Albert Dehan, where he used whole body plethysmography and treated the mice with morphine at a reasonably high dose, um, 100 milligrams per kilogram, and measured ventilation at a um, range of inspired CO2 levels. He found that in wild type mice, morphine reduced ventilation at all of these inspired CO2 levels and also decreased the slope of this response. Compare that to the mu receptor knockout animals where morphine um, had no effect at any of the uh, inspired CO2 concentrations. So then he quantified these data using the slope of this response. Um, so in the wild type animals, the morphine treatments reduced the slope of the hypercapnic ventilatory response like this. Um, whereas in the knockout animals, morphine had no effect on the slope of this response. So there are a few ways that um, morphine opioid-induced respiratory depression can be analyzed. So this, these data you know, indicate that mu receptors are important for um, respiratory depression, uh, but it's a global mu receptor knockout. So this led to, to the question, where are the mu opioid receptors that depress breathing? And before I answer that, I'll just briefly summarize uh, the control of breathing circuitry. Um, so you have um, in the ventral lateral medulla, a column of structures. You have the, pre -ins the inspiratory premotor neurons in the rostral ventral respiratory group. These project out to the phrenic motor neurons found in the spinal cord. Uh, the pre-Butzinger complex generates inspiratory rhythm. The Butzinger complex contains mainly inhibitory neurons that are active during expiration. The RTN or the parafacial respiratory group comes into play during active expiration in times of high metabolic drive. And then in the dorsal medulla, you have the nucleus of the solitary tract, which is a integrator of the chemoreflexes. And then in the dorsal lateral pons, you have the lateral parabrachial area and the collector fusae, or KF, um, which are important for modulating respiratory rate pattern and control of the upper airways. So all of these structures are highly interconnected. Um, the KF especially sends dense glutamatergic projections to nearly all aspects of the uh, medullary respiratory control centers and receives reciprocal um, feedback from these centers as well, um, including ones that aren't shown here. So the question was, where are opioid receptors in this network? And there is at least some evidence that mu opioid receptors are expressed in all of these centers. So we were interested um, in understanding how opioids affect uh, the dorsal lateral pons in order to depress breathing. And so this is in the remainder of my talk um, will be part one of the remainder of my talk. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to also talk about uh, mu opioid receptors in the NTS. The, so the postdoc in the lab, um, Otto Varga, was uh, interested in 
the, how the opioid containing KF neurons contribute to uh, respiratory depression. So what she did is she used mice with blocks to mute opioid receptors, injected a virus encoding pre into the KF. Um, this will delete opioid receptors um, from the KF neuron, the entire KF neuron, including the somatodendritic area, as well as receptors on terminals and projection areas as well. But then she measured breathing um, using head out plethysmography. At the time we were using head out plethysmography, which um, Laura mentioned, um, because we were worried about that locomotor activity um, caused by morphine and then the inability to find a quiet breathing state. Um, so we um, restrained the animal um, in these head out plethysmograph chambers um, to prevent that locomotor activity. So briefly, Again, the mouse's head is in a separate chamber from its body. And what we're really measuring is just the displacement of air from the body chamber as the mouse uh, breathes. So I'm going to walk through some of the experiments that we did, um, but I wanna point out that Kevin Yackel's lab at UCSF did very similar deletion experiments um, and found results that were more similar than they were different um, to ours. And he used a whole body plethysmography um, both in normal standard air as well as um, L CO2 elevated um, air. And so if you're really interested in this um, area, I encourage you to look at his paper as well. So before we put the mouse in the plasmograph, we injected it with either saline or morphine. And then we normalized um, the breathing rate for each animal um, compared to its saline control. And so that's what's shown on the y-axis here is the percent of the baseline um, saline breathing rates. We use three different doses of morphine, starting with a near maximal antinociceptive dose of morphine and going up tenfold to um, a much higher uh, dose of morphine, 100 milligrams per kilogram, the same dose that Albert Dehan had used in that knockout study. And we saw in the control GFP injected animals, a nice dose dependent decrease in breathing rate and then compared that to the animals with mu receptors that were deleted from the KF. And the effect of morphine was attenuated at all three of these doses. So this suggested that KF neurons are involved in opioid-induced respiratory suppression, um, but the effect of morphine is attenuated, right? Not completely eliminated. So this led to the question of what else contributes. The list of potential candidates is pretty long. Um, we chose to directly compare the pre butzmir complex. So using exactly the same approach, we deleted mu receptors from the pre butzinger complex. And we saw at this lower dose of morphine um, that the effect was attenuated. However, when we looked at the higher doses of morphine, we were surprised to see that deleting mu receptors from the pre butzinger complex was no longer uh, protective against the decrease in breathing rate. And in fact, if anything, we saw this very strange ataxic breathing pattern emerge. Um, and these traces, inspiration is up. Um, so we saw um, a pretty ataxic pattern, especially compared to um, the mu receptor deletion from the KF. And I'm not showing it here, but we also quantified the number of apneas. And at least at 30 milligrams per kilogram, there were significantly more apneas when we deleted mu receptors from the pre botsinger complex. So um, in summary, these data um, that we you know, collected using plethysmography helped indicate that these opioid sensitive KF neurons really do contribute to opioid suppression of respiratory rates because when we delete opioid receptors from these neurons, um, morphine is not as effective and you end up with a higher breathing rate. So this led us to dig a little deeper into the mechanisms and try to understand how opioids are inhibiting these KF neurons to suppress breathing. And so the first thing that we did is just recorded from KF neurons in brain slices. And after recording from a bunch of neurons, we found that about two thirds of the neurons I recorded from were directly hyperpolarized by an opioid agonist. And this is due to activation of a G-protein coupled inwardly rectifying potassium conductor. So by the uh, somatodendritic mu opioid receptors. We then wanted to know if these neurons that were um, inhibited or hyperpolarized by opioid agonists were the ones that were projecting to the ventral lateral medulla. So in order to determine this, a uh, graduate student, Jordan Bateman, injected fluorescent retrobeads into the ventral lateral medulla 
and then recorded from fluorescently labeled KF neurons and applied the opioid agonist metenkeflin and again saw outward currents. If you look at um, across the population of neurons, he saw a very similar proportion, about two thirds of the neurons he recorded from had this opioid mediated outward current that projected to either the pre Botzinger or the RPRG. So now these KF neurons have um, that project to the ventral lateral medulla are hyperpolarized by somatodendritic mu opioid receptors. We wanted to know if they also have opioid receptors on the axon terminals in the projection area as well. So in order to test this, Jordan injected a virus including channel rhodopsin into the KF, and then he record, made slices and recorded from pre Botzinger complex neurons or RBRG neurons, but I'm only gonna show the data from the pre Botzinger neurons. Um, so he recorded from pre Botzinger complex neurons and stimulated the channel rhodopsin expressing KF terminals using blue lights. So shown here, um, and he recorded specifically from VGLUT2 positive pre Botzinger complex neurons. So shown here is an example recording from a pre Botzinger complex neuron. Stimulation of the KF terminals leads to um, these glutamatergic excitatory postsynaptic currents, and these, um, or EPSCs. And these EPSCs were inhibited by the opioid agonist metenkeflin, and that was reversed when it washed from the slice. And you can see the summary data um, here to the right. And this, um, the inhibition by metenkeflin was associated with an in increase in the paired pulse ratio indicating that it was presynaptic mu opioid receptors on the axon terminals of the KF neurons that were inhibiting glutamate release onto the pre Botzinger complex neurons. So in summary, um, we, we found when we dug a little deeper that KF neurons um, send glutamatergic projections that synapse onto pre Botzinger and RBRG neurons, and that these neurons are inhibited by both somatodendritic mu opioid receptors as well as mu opioid receptors on terminals in the projection region. And so opioid inhibition um, of this excitatory circuit could lead to the robust inhibition of inspiratory output that we've observed using plethysmography. So now I'm going to change gears a little and address the second question, which was how do opioids suppress the hypercapnic ventilatory response? Um, to answer this question, we thought that the NCS was a nice um, Site to place to start um, because previous studies had shown that injection of the selective mu opioid agonist DAMGO into the caudal medial NTS pairs both the hypoxic and the hypercapnic ventilatory response. Um, so when thinking about how this could occur, um, we thought of two possibilities. The first is that um, mu receptors are on the hypercapnia responsive neurons and that they directly inhibit them. So that would be a postsynaptic mechanism. And the second is that there could be an indirect mechanism whereby opioid agonists um, inhibit the uh, neurons that are activated by hypercapnia. So the question that these two undergraduates um, wanted to answer was, are the NTS neurons activated by hypercapnia inhibited by opioids? To test this again, um, we are using the um, VivoFlow plethysmography chambers and we had four conditions. Um, we either injected mice with saline or morphine and then exposed them to either room air or uh, hypercapnia, which had 7% CO2. Uh, we, uh, the exposure time was for 60 minutes. Um, and then we used CFOS um, as the immediate early gene, um, CFOS as an indicator of neuronal activation. So consistent with what's been published previously, um, exposure of these mice to hypercapnia increased the number of CFOS expressing cells. Um, CFOS here is shown in green. I mean, you see a significant increase uh, in the animals that received hypercapnia. Then when we uh, looked at the animals that received morphine, morphine caused a large increase in um, the number of CFOS expressing cells. Notice the y-axis here. Um, but when we added hypercapnia with morphine, you still saw an increase in the number of CFOS positive cells. So this indicated to us that um, hypercapnia and morphine were activating separate populations of neurons. 
So we wanted to look a little closer and see if those neurons that were activated by hypercapnia express new opioid receptors. In order to do this, we used more cream mice, um, and then we crossed them with uh, AI9 TD tomato Cree reporter mice. So that generated mice where any cells that express the mute opioid receptor will also express TD tomato. When you look in the NTS region, you can see a significant amount of, NTF, of a mu opioid receptor containing cells in this region, especially compared to the surrounding area. Then we exposed these mice to hypercapnia uh, and saw again that hypercapnia increased the number of CFOS positive cells. But when we looked at the CFOS positive cells to see how many of them co-expressed TD tomato to indicate um, mu opioid receptor expression, we saw very, very few, one to three or zero to three cells uh, per slice. Um, and if you look at the percentages over here, um, the percent of hypercapnia activated uh, CVOX positive neurons that express mu opioid receptors was only 7%, so very, very low. So most of the hypercapnia activated neurons do not express mu opioid receptors, suggesting that the effects in, of opioids in the NTS are uh, indirect. So in summary, um, using plethysmography, we identified that KF neurons contribute to opioid-induced respiratory depression at both low and high doses of morphine. We've used neurophysiology to show that these uh, KF neurons uh, project to the ventral lateral medulla and are inhibited by somatodendritic mu opioid receptors. There are also mu opioid receptors on axon terminals of these KF neurons that inhibit glutamate release onto um, the pre and RVRG neurons. And then finally, the opioid actions in the NTS that uh, might impair chemoreflexes seem to be indirect, perhaps by presynaptic mechanisms. So just kind of overall plethysmography when used um, correctly is a really valuable tool um, that can be used in combination with neurophysiology and histology um, or other techniques and help reveal circuit-based mechanisms of opioid-induced respiratory depression. That, I would like to thank uh, the members of the Levitt Lab. I tried to acknowledge um, people who contributed to each section on the slides. Um, I'd also like to thank collaborators um, and my funding sources. Uh, thank the University of Florida and the Breathe Center at UF for supporting me while I was here. Um, I'm soon going to be moving to the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Michigan. Um, and then finally, I again want to thank APS and CIREC for um, sponsoring this webinar and allowing me to participate. And I think now um, we're going to open the floor to questions um, for both speakers. Thank you so much. Another wonderful talk. Um, I think this is really successful. We do have a long list of questions. We'll try to get to as many as possible. So I'm going to kind of try to go in order. Uh, one of the questions was, have sex differences been observed with either head out or whole body plethysmography? Either one of you. <laughs> okay, I can take that one. Um, I don't know of any. Uh, yeah, Erica, yeah, you have to t tell people who that's for. That was definitely for okay. Laura. And you're amazing, but that was definitely for Laura. Okay, so um, I don't I don't know the answer, and um, I that most recent paper that just came out last week in JAP and in Innovative Methodology they do study males and females, but I don't believe they saw any differences in that head out method. Of course, there are differences um, with you know knockout males and females with, you know, across different experiments, but I haven't seen differences in control animals, but I would definitely be interested if somebody wants to comment in the chat. Uh, of course, it's been really well established in, in rats. Uh, I believe that not, I have not seen as much in, in mice. I'm going to ask, ask the next question for Laura as well. Um, as we all know, sleep can affect breathing. Is there a sleep deficit in your Down syndrome mice? And kind of the two part of this question, what time of day do you collect these 10 minute readings? And is there a difference between night and day and possibly uh, with the sleep state differences? 
Right. So we study mice in the light cycle, the hours four to seven of the light cycle and hours four to seven of the dark cycle. We chose that range uh, because it's enough into the new cycle, but also gave us about three hours to, to do the experiment. Um, I have not observed sleep deficits in this model, but so many people are studying the model. I wouldn't be surprised if it came out in the last month and I missed it, um, but I'm not aware of uh, sleep disturbance. Uh, I'd really like to do EEG in these mice and follow them during sleep to be able to monitor uh, sleep apnea, uh, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, now I'm going to switch to Erica. Uh, clearly, there is an effect of opioids on frequency. Is there any suppressive effect of opioids on body temperature? And could this contribute to the apparent effect on tidal volume, possibly related to the suppressive effect on movement or even sleep induction? Um, yeah, so we have looked at body temperature in the opioid treated mice. Um, and at the dose, we at 30 milligrams per kilogram, there wasn't a huge decrease in temperature, less than a one degree difference. Um, at higher doses, 100 milligrams per kilogram, we can get, start to get um, decreases in body temperature. So yes, that if you don't compensate for that, that could obviously contribute. Um, and I mentioned the, the effects of opioids on tidal volume are also dose dependent. So you don't start to see decreases in amplitude of breathing until you end up with higher um, concentrations of opioids. So that could be part of the reason, um, but also using at lower doses, you see an increase in tidal volume and you still see that increase, can see hints at least of those increases in tidal volume, even with head output tomography, which doesn't rely on temperature um, in order to measure uh, amplitude of breathing. So I don't think it's entirely uh, temperature dependent. Long question, uh, long answer. Uh, I'll ask another one to you. I'm trying to bounce back and forth. Uh, what other respiratory regions outside of the prebot and KF neurons do you think significantly contribute to opioid-induced respiratory depression? Oh, there are so many. My list was very long. Um, so the NTS obviously could be one player. Um, the caudal medullary raphae could be another player. Um, Astrid Stuckey has a recent paper where she had to, she added naloxone to dorsolateral pons, pre Botzinger pretty largely, as well as caudal medullary raphe. And it wasn't until she added in the caudal medullary raphe antagonism that she completely eliminated uh, Remy fentanyl induced respiratory suppression. And we also have a project looking at locus ceruleus, which also has opioid receptors um, derived from the cortex. Who knows? <laughs> There's a lot of possibilities. Peripheral opioid receptors. Yeah. Okay, back to Laura. Uh, if the goal of an experiment is to determine VEVO2 in response to hypoxia or hypercapnia, is a flow rate of 150 mils per minute for 10 minutes sufficient to reach steady state? Any comment on chamber volume or flow rate selection given the specific experimental goals? So a uh, good question and apologize if I wasn't clear on that. So for the baseline measures for um, baseline calm breathing, we use 150 mils per minute, but for hypercapnia and hypoxia, we go to 300 and we get steady state at two minutes and 43 seconds uh, on average. So we are able to get steady state with 300 mils per minute, but I think it's really important to check with your own particular chamber and flow meters um, to to see uh, how quickly you're able to observe steady state with your particular setup. I think we've gotten a couple of the questions about um, normalizing to body mass. Is that still standard practice? How important is that? And I think either one of you can, can answer that. I'll say, I think a lot of reviewers are still asking for it. So in that sense, um, it's perhaps still uh, best practice. Uh, I prefer to use it as a covariate, body weight as a covariate in our um, analyses, but we do often still present uh, uh, per body weight, but I think it's more appropriate to normalize to metabolic rate. Yeah, I just answered in the, the chat. We the. We normalized the most recent data to body weight in response to reviewers' requests. So thank you. 
your answer. <laughs> So I'm just going to ask one more quick question because we're at the top of the hour. This is for Laura again. You said the target CO2 for metabolic measurements was 0.1% to 0.5%. Is that the set percent coming into the pleth chamber or expired CO2 in the chamber? That would be the expired CO2. So what our CO2 analyzer is showing as the current levels within the chamber. I, I don't like it to go closer to 1% because then I'm concerned it could influence uh, control of breathing with that higher level of CO2. So we've always done 0.1 to 0.5 and are able to get sensitive uh, measurements, but it would also depend on the size of your chamber and flow rates, uh, all of those things together. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks for all the great questions, the great talks, the chats. Uh, I think this was really successful. Um, we want to just quickly mention, if you have a couple minutes, there's going to be a survey to fill out uh, just about this session and if you have interest in future webinars. And we thank you all. This was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone.